Ein grundsätzlicher Punkt im Datenjournalismus und auch in der Wissenschaft sind natürlich die Ausspielwege, auf denen denn diese ganzen Informationen, Volker Stollotz hat es angesprochen, verbreitet werden, gebündelt werden, wo man sie herbekommt. Und gemeinhin werden diese Ausspiel, ja, mir fällt fast kein anderes Wort ein, diese Plattformen als Plattformen bezeichnet. Was macht man traditionell, wenn man sich überlegt, was ist denn das eigentlich? Stellen wir uns mal ganz dumm, was ist denn eigentlich eine Plattform? Man geht entweder zu Wikipedia oder man geht zum Duden. Und ich bin mal zum Duden gegangen. Und da steht zum Thema, wenn man wissen will, was eine Plattform ist, erstmal ganz traditionell, erster Vorschlag, mit einem Geländer gesicherte ebene Fläche auf hohen Gebäuden, Türmen oder Ähnlichen, Klammer auf, von der aus man einen guten Ausblick hat. Klammer zu. Kann man was mit anfangen. Zweite Definition. Nein, es kommt immer noch nicht unser modernes Verständnis von Plattformen. Die zweite Definition ist eine Fläche am vorderen oder hinteren Ende älterer Straßen oder Eisenbahnwagen zum Ein- und Aussteigen. Und das hat mir dann eigentlich schon ganz gut gefallen, weil man kann sich das so ein bisschen vorstellen, also eine Information, die da in dem Wagen sitzt, die vielleicht auch gehaltvoll irgendwo hinkommt und dann können da Leute draufspringen oder auch wieder abspringen. Vielleicht auch springen Leute drauf, die Böses im Schilde führen, Fake News verbreiten. Das Bild gefiel mir dann eigentlich ganz gut. irgendwie. Und ich dachte dann, bevor ich mich dann in die weiteren Definitionen, da kommen dann tatsächlich, ich glaube unter Punkt 4 kommt dann unser modernes Verständnis von Plattform. Ich mich da verkünstel, frage ich jetzt lieber jemanden, der sich mit sowas wirklich auskennt. Und ich bin deshalb sehr froh, hier jo äh, José van Dijk zu begrüßen. Sie ist äh, Professorin für Medienwissenschaften an der Universität Utrecht in den Niederlanden, lange davor an der Universität Amsterdam, war auch mehrere Jahre Präsidentin der Niederländischen Akademie der Wissenschaften und ich muss gestehen, ich kenne niemanden, der sich besser zum Thema Plattformen auskennt und was das sozusagen für unser Thema bedeutet und was es denn nun wirklich ist, jenseits dieser Fläche auf den Straßenbahnen oder ähm, Dingen, wo man einen guten Ausblick hat. Das wird sie uns jetzt in ihrer Keynote erzählen. Herzlich willkommen, Rossi van Dijk. Dankeschön, Holger. Das ist sehr... Sehr nett von dir. Uh, okay, let's wait. I switch to English now, is that okay? <laughs> I do speak a little German, but I feel very uncomfortable, you know, when I have to give a full speech in German, but I understand it perfectly. So your definitions of the, uh, the various meanings of platforms, oh, I actually have to, um, uh, whoops. Yes, there it is. Sorry. Um, so it's a long time ago that I picked up on your definition of platforms. And I actually started in one of my uh, presentations four years ago. I started with the definition, the sort of history of definitions of platforms. I no longer do that because platforms and the, the actual meaning of platforms has become so common now that I no longer start with the definition. But I indeed did that like four or five years ago. So I will be talking today about what I call the platformization of news and particularly I would like to talk to you and uh, hopefully have some more dialogue about uh, public values in an online world. And most of my talk is actually coming from a book, a recent book, um, it's, it's six months old now, called The Platform Society. It's uh, p uh, Public Values in a, connect a Collective World. It's published by Oxford University Press, but I would particularly like to thank my uh, co-authors, Martijn de Waal and Thomas Poel, uh, with whom I've sort of, you know, been in dialogue for a number of years, like four, five years. And we, while we were writing this book, we actually published a Dutch edition of this book in 2016. After we finished that, it came out, open access, you, so you can still download it. But since 2016, if you read Dutch, by the way, uh, but since 2016, things have changed so tremendously that we had to start all over again, basically, and rewrite the entire book. So when it finally came out in December 2018, well, we pretty much decided in, t uh, in February that we had to start all over again and sort of rewrite the book. The object of our concern is changing so fast and so rapidly that we could 
pretty much write a different book every couple of years. So what happened since 2016, basically since we finished the first version? Well, lots of things happened, but I'm sure that you encountered mostly problems about platforms and how we deal with platforms, particularly social media platforms. Um, so since 2016, we've encountered problems of disinformation and fake news, which I will be talking about more uh, briefly in a short while, particularly on YouTube and Facebook. Um, we have seen in 2016, that that's when we had just finished the book for a month. This was a month after the American elections, and that's why we decided we had to start all over again because of the election intervention of, you know, that became a major scandal, of course, and that turned into the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, last, just two months ago, Facebook, of course, received a big fine for that particular scandal, five billion euros or dollars, I think it was dollars, but it has, has hardly made a dent in their actual policies. I will come back to that later. Hate speech and trolling has become a huge problem on the internet and particularly in social media platforms. Um, but that's not you know, the end of the, the kind of problems that we've run into. Security leaks, we just over the past week, I've been sort of counting the number of uh, security leaks that I saw in the newspaper. I think I lost count after seven or eight and those were major scandals. So. It doesn't stop their privacy scandals. Of course, we can hardly count them and they're continuing to this very day. Privacy scan uh, scandals have really, really, uh, you know, been, uh, uh, there have been a tremendous amount of those in on the internet. And then problems I won't go into today, but tax evasion has been a major problem. You know, the tax laws do not apply to many of these platform companies, tech companies who have been accused of evading uh, tax systems that are us usually um, organized nation, uh, nationally. And finally, undermining labor laws, you've heard about that mostly in the context of Uber and a couple of other platform companies, but I will not talk about that today. So we'll be mainly um, dealing with a couple of problems, mostly hate speech, uh, sorry, disinformation, fake news, and a little bit of hate speech. So. My, our conclusion, basically, after you know, uh, under, or after seeing how those problems were basically enter, entering our internet society, we concluded that long-term, long-standing values that really promote an open society, values like tolerance, like democracy, like fairness, they're really compromised in the current online infrastructure that distributes pretty much all of our cultural goods. Think of news video, social talk, private communication. I don't think there's a single person in this room, but I can ask this to you know, entire halls of students, full of students. They can no longer do without the infrastructure that platform co tech companies have built for them. So in light of those scandals and you know, the change of that communication landscape over the past few years, we decided to focus on this particular question, and I've rephrased it a little bit to focus more particularly on journalism here, but who is responsible for guarding public values in a platform society in general, but more particularly in that news landscape that is f changing tremendously fast? And that is in a world where uh, we are almost entirely dependent on the American uh, online ecosystem. So over the next 40, 45 minutes, and then I would love to engage in you know, a dialogue with you, but I would like to talk about four issues. About platform ecosystems, what are they? Uh, there are several in the world, I will explain that in a little bit. Talk about public values, what are they and how do we negotiate them? Thirdly, who is responsible for implementing public values, particularly in the news landscape, but when we're talking about fighting fake news, how do we distribute responsibility for doing that? And finally, I will um, talk about fake news more specifically and how that has changed the uh, uh, platform landscape. Now let's start about, you know, sort of sketching what the global on online world is today and how we're dealing with that. Um, mostly my talk will derive from political, social, and uh, economic uh, perspectives, but 
I hope, you know, later on we can pretty much discuss a lot of, you know, the more philosophical uh, perspectives that you just introduced to us and I think are very, very important. In the global online world, that world is pretty much driven by platforms and uh, fueled by data flows. That is basically what we're looking at. And platforms and data flows can be st steered by two kinds of entities, by companies and by states. Now, this world, the, you know, the current online world is mostly, not entirely, but uh, uh, almost entirely dominated by two platform ecosystems that are dominant in this world. And that's the American and the Chinese platform ecosystem. Let's start with the Chinese. I won't linger too much on that because, you know, we probably won't in go, go into details, but China has its own ecosystem that is controlled by the state, but is operated by the big five uh, tech companies in China. Mostly the three uh, largest one, those are Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. That's what we call them BAT. Um, Alibaba is the Chinese Amazon, in case you don't know. Tencent operates WeChat. Uh, there's two more, Jingo Dong Mall, Jidaecom, which is a very big one, and Didi, which is pretty much the Chinese Uber. Um, so that's the landscape in, uh, in China. Now, Alibaba and Tencent particularly are becoming extremely powerful. They're branching out their core business, which is the platform industry, um, uh, basically into every sector of society. We will see their mirror in the American la uh, system later. But they have pretty much become gatekeepers to the entire Chinese e uh, economy and beyond the Chinese eco economy. But they're wielding power over brick and mortar enterprises through their own pay systems. For instance, WeChat has a build, built in uh, uh, WePay pay system, which is very powerful in China. Its own communication channels, even its own grocery stores and pharmacies and healthcare. Now, the Chinese state, as you know, has very strict power over those companies. And Interestingly, their sheer size, the size of those companies, the, especially the th uh, three big ones, makes it easier for the authorities to control what happens you know, in that landscape. Um, pretty much all data flows are controlled by the state and they have access to all the data flows in, uh, that come from uh, Chinese companies. And you've probably ho heard of the Sesame Credit uh, system in China. Anyone who hasn't heard of that or are you familiar with that? The, no, you're not. Uh, it, well, it, it goes too far to explain this, but um, basically every data flow goes through the control of the state, the state and the Sesame Credit system uh, adds up, accumulates all those points that you gather through all kinds of surveillance systems, and that will give you a personal score in China, right? So, for instance, if you're jaywalk a crossroad you know and you're picked up by the facial recognition systems uh, within 20 minutes you will get a fine through your WePay uh, account and you will be fined if you get fined more than three times you may be uh, barred entrance to your favorite university right so that's how far the system goes but that the sesame credit system is uh, uh, described in detail in uh, a couple of very interesting publication so, um so I will leave the American system here, but now we're going to the American platform system, which you're all familiar with. I don't think there's anyone in this room who hasn't used any of a uh, platform operated by those five companies over the past week. Anyone here in this room who has not used any of these uh, platforms owned by these companies over the past week? No fingers, okay. so. This sort of warrants my conclusion that all of you have become pretty much dependent on the American platform ecosystem. And of course, there's the big five companies that dominate this ecosystem, Alphabet, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft. Um, they're not coincidentally also the five biggest firms in the world right now in terms of market capitalization. So it's really becoming increasingly more clear how powerful these companies really are. And they dominate the rest of the world, Asia, except for China, but the Americas, Europe, and Africa. Um, a lot of these American tech companies have tried to enter the Chinese ecosystem, but they were either barred, for instance, Facebook, it's not allowed to operate in China, or they were censored. You know, many of the platforms were censored or had to build their systems according to the American uh, censorship system 
or they were, for they were forced to align with Chinese companies. Uh, Google Search, for instance, has been trying to enter the Chinese market for a long time. Project D Dragonfly was very controversial, even among uh, uh, Google's own uh, employees. Now, recently, the US is trying to bar Chinese companies from entering American markets, which is the other way around. That didn't happen until, I think, you know, two years ago. Um, that trade war is currently, you know, going on, and I don't know where it ends. But one thing, for one thing, I think these, uh, it's, they'll be very, very hard to separate these two systems. Why? Because they have really sort of become very entangled. And um, the two systems, of course, at first sight, appear to be very, very different. You know, they almost seem like two completely different systems. GAFAM is owned by corporations, um, and of course, the, the corporations are uh, driven by corporate surveillance, and that stems from a typical Silicon Valley libertarian capitalism. Um, so that seems very, very different from BAT, the BAT system, where the data are owned by the state, where civilians are subject to state surveillance of online all their online activities, and where um, capitalism is basically executed by companies, but it's basically a form of state capitalism. Now, although they're vastly different uh, at the ideological level, they're increasingly intertwined at two levels. They're in, in, uh, intertwined at the economic level. For instance, there are several partnerships. They have, you know, mutual uh, part shareholder positions. The financial flows are very interesting. If you look into it, you will notice that uh, the f out of, I think, the five Chinese companies, four of them are actually on trade markets outside of China, mostly, and they're mostly registered at the Cayman Islands. Three of them are registered on the Cayman Islands. So it's a very intricate uh, international financial flow. Um, but also, and maybe, you know, one detail that you didn't know is that Apple, for instance, 40% of all the revenue that comes from the Apple App Store is made in China, which you know, shows you how complicated those financial flows at, at the economic level are. But also at the technical level, the material infrastructure in both systems is very, very similar. You know, it relies on the same sort of mechanisms. So it will be extremely difficult to disentangle those systems. Even, you know, in a continuing trade war, it will be very, very different, different to take them apart and to turn them into two completely separate systems. Okay, what happens in Europe? You know, we're squeezed in between those two very ideologically different systems. And in, the, uh, in this continent, we have basically no major platforms, at least no infrastructural platforms. You know what this, this dot stands for? It's the biggest uh, European platform company. Yeah, you're right, it's Spotify. But that Spotify is the only major European plat platform in the top 50. It's actually number 49, so in that top 50, it's not very high. But uh, ironically, it's no longer European because it, uh, Tencent now has minority shares in Spotify, as you may know, and it's listed on the New York, uh, the New York Stock Exchange. So there again, you know, for their infrastructural services, even if Europe has a few of those un unicorn, a few tech companies that they can rely on for their platforms. They're usually, you know, not very infrastructural. I will explain to you in a minute what I mean by that. But, um, you know, more than that, for instance, the uh, the corporate head headquarters of all the tech companies, 40% uh, is, 47% is located in Asia, 36% in North America, and only 15% in Europe. And of those 15%, the, the, the companies that we do have that are actually uh, operating uh, major platforms, they're sort of single platforms. Take, for instance, uh, we just mentioned Spotify, but uh, Estonia has Skype. It was actually bought up by Microsoft a couple of years ago. Taxify is quite a big platform in Europe that is fully European. The Netherlands has a couple. Adyen is a big pay system platform that you may have heard of, but Still, they're very isolated. They're isolated examples of unicorn and platform systems that do not um, make up that entire ecosystem through which, you know, the corporations basically own the uh, social media traffic. Now, 
what does that mean about, what does that say about how these platform companies exercise power? And for this, I would like you to use your imagination. And um, I try to use the metaphor of a tree to explain how vertical ownership of platforms work in uh, the tech world. Uh, platform power is actually distributed at three levels. And I call them, this is just basically my own uh, thing because it's not nowhere in laws, it's not anchored in, in legal discourse where you know where they talk about power. But I divided them into the roots, the trunk, and the branches. Now the roots stand for the internet architecture that is increasingly becoming platformized. They're becoming services. Think of, for instance, you know, their uh, internet architecture, but also digital infrastructure, hardware, ISPs, internet service providers but also satellites, data centers, domain, the whole domain name system, that's all part of the, uh, of the, uh, the roots infrastructure. Now, for our book, we have not researched that part, simply because we didn't have time, the rest was complicated enough, but I will certainly, in, I'm intent on doing that, you know, in the next, next stage of research. Um, by the way, Google, Amazon, and Facebook are increasingly in, uh, infiltrating that uh, the, the, the root level. You know, they're increasingly buying up data centers because they're simply, you know, even, you know, they're putting down cables in the ground, there's satellites up there, etc. That's because they're, they are, for their business, increasingly uh, dependent on that digital infrastructure. So it's very, very crucial for them that they own and operate uh, that level. Now we'll come to the trunk and the branches. The trunk stands for intermedia platforms that we did research for, and the branches, of course, for the sectors that we have been looking in. And I will show to you why that vertical integration of platform, uh, uh, platform ecosystems is so important to control the entire data flows that you know, are absorbed and are used towards business models. As I said, those five companies are controlling, you know, that big e ecosystems. And uh, as I said, it's, you know, together these companies are the fifth largest economy in the world after the US, China, Germany, Japan. Um, but my interest is actually in, econo it's not so much in economic power, but in societal influence and why they are so powerful. How come that through that vertical integration, they have become so powerful in controlling certain parts of the public sphere, like news and information. Now, what we did for our book is to, we wanted to understand how that the intermediary structure, structure, how that operates. Now, we inventory about 70 platforms, which we now call intermediary eh, or infrastructural platforms, such as social networks, of course, social networks. You see each of them have a cloud, each of the companies. And the, the bigger the size of the, uh, the circles, the more powerful those platforms are. It, you may not have enough detail, but it's in the book and online where you can find this picture. Uh, social networks, of course, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, owned by Microsoft, web hosting, pay systems, identification services, cloud services, cloud, you know, basically Amazon and Google divide the cloud service business. Um, advertising, Google and Facebook own pretty much divide that 60 and 40% between them. Search engines, in Europe alone, Google owns 90% of the search engine market. Uh, operating systems, of course, Android versus uh, iOS. Navigation, maps, messaging services, app stores, app stores is basically Apple and Google. Analytics services, AI division. So this is what you find in that trunk of the trees. And society or societies, entire nations are becoming increasingly dependent on what Mark Zuckerberg has <laughs> called a social infrastructure. He calls, you know, his face, his blue app, the social infrastructure of society. Now, there's even a debate in the United States whether these platforms have become not simply, you know, platforms to ha uh, put all your online activities through social traffic, but a public utilities like we have in terms of train or that sort, trains or any other public uh, ut uh, utilities. But besides owning that, those five, uh, the platforms in the middle, the intermediary platforms, now you're looking at the tree from above, um, the big five are also branching out into sectors. And 
specific sectoral platforms are increasingly interwoven with those intermediate intermediary platforms in the middle. Now, we could only research four specific areas for our book. Those are two public sectors, health and education, and two private sectors, which is news and urban transport. Now, platformization, of course, does not just affect those four sectors, but way beyond that, you know, it, uh, we could also have taken into account finance or retail or hospitality or food. We just have time to do those four. Um, and I will, s I will concentrate on news in uh, the rest of my talk. But for instance, if you look at news, what you can see is that uh, Google, of course, owns a big aggregator in that sector. Apple, so does Apple News. Facebook Instant Articles has become a big major player. And then, of course, Facebook also has in its intermediary platforms Newsfeed, which is a big feature in the blue app. Um, also, through acquisitions, you see there the Washington Post, of course, was bought up by Amazon. And so that is part, has become part, Amazon has become part of that platform system. Now, here I take as an example one you know, one platform, Alphabet Google. And I'll try to show how it controls part of those, not just the intermediary platforms, but also part of the other platforms, the sectoral platforms. For instance, if you look at transport, the urban transport uh, sector, you see that Alphabet controls 20% of Uber shares. Google Maps, for instance, is built into Uber. Waze, the navigation, that's the biggest navigation uh, platform, is, was acquired by Google and is now part of that ecosystem. If you look at health, Google owns uh, uh, true Google Health, which basically aggregates all the different health apps that, are, that you buy in through the App Store. And uh, 23andMe, it has a big share in 23andMe, which is the biggest DNA database in the world, uh, which is actually the company is run by uh, Sergei Brinch's um, uh, ex-wife, I think. Um, education, very interesting area, which I think is really under-researched, uh, also by journalists, by the way. But, of course, Google Search and Scholar pretty much dominate that area. But uh, if you look at schools right now, they're being inundated by uh, Chrome laptops. They're sold through Google very cheaply, 150 bucks. And built into those Chrome laptops are, of course, Google Apps for Education, which are the 10 basic educational platforms that lead you to the, the, you know, the main arteries of that tree, which is the Google uh, uh, platform ecosystem. And then, of course, the Google News Aggregator, which is a big one. Now, if you look at this system, it is not just through ownership and acquisition that this ecosystem of companies becomes very powerful, but particularly through their ability co to control and to connect those data flows, both between the intermediary apps, but also between the intermediary, the trunk sort of arteries and the sectoral platforms. And in between the sectors, you will also find links between you know, news and uh, various other areas. Um, so basically what you're seeing is that the entire system is built on an infrastructure that's owned and operated by those five, uh, four co five companies. Now, that entire ecosystem, of course, works on, is fueled by data and driven by algorithms, but it's particularly driven by um, commercial values and market forces, efficiency and advertising revenue, of course, attention. Those are the ingredients of a successful ecosystem. Now, talking about commercial values, leaves us with the question, what does this do to public values? And let's raise that question of what are public values and what are they doing for the common good? How are they anchored in that system? Where are they anchored? And I think many of the problems that you sh I showed you in the beginning are actually the result of public values being put aside or not being built into that system. So that's what I would like to discuss with you. What kind of values are we talking about? Well, basic public values in society are things like security, of course, uh, transparency, accuracy, privacy, but there's a number of others that I don't mention here, human rights, autonomy, I could go on and on, but these are, I think, the values mostly discussed in relation to platforms. Now, public values are not something 
you know, some things that are fixed, that you can go to a store, you can buy them off the shelf and just implement them into your system. Public values are often negotiated at different levels of society. I will come to that right now. Um, for instance, the privacy of individuals may sit in tension with securities, uh, security of, you know, environments that you have to deal with. And transparency may, may sit in tension with uh, privacy. For instance, in journalism, uh, you all know that personalized news, you know, the personalized news um, uh, mechanism where the privacy of persons may strain, in fact, the democratic control of information flows. So there's always this kind of negotiation going on between values that you want to implement into a system, but they need to be negotiated at the base. But beyond those typical internet values that were now, you know, privacy, security, you hear a lot of them, they've been dealt with over the past few years. Beyond those values, we have a lot more of, you know, public values that pertain to society as a whole. And they concern, they're concerned with fairness, with inclusivity, inclusiveness, with responsibility, who takes care of those values, mm -hmm. accountability and democratic control. Now, these kind of public values were historically always anchored in institutions, public institutions that we have, also in sectoral laws. You know, every sector has, is regulated by sectoral laws or by professional codes. Think of the, pro, you know, the profession of journalism, which has, has its own uh, uh, code. Legally, for instance, news organizations are liable for hate speech or for discrimination, and from a professional journalist, we expect accurate, fair, and comprehensive reporting. But the interesting thing is that, and since they have been doing this since their uh, uh, introduction, particularly uh, social media platforms, they often bypass or ignore entire sectors. They go straight to consumers. So what happens is that they also, tradition, you know, those traditional uh, anchored values, they bypass those and they sort of evade the negotiation about public values. So that's why social media platforms increasingly institutionalize their own rules and their own judgment about what is accurate or fair or democratic reporting. And here you see an example of how um, Mark Zuckerberg, particularly Facebook, has bypassed or escaped sectoral responsibility. This was 2016, right after the American election, when Facebook, of course, immediately came under fire for the creation of fa filter bubbles and uh, fake news. And S Zuckerberg immediately said, well, hey, we're not responsible for this, you know? We're not a media company, we're not a news company, we do not produce news, that's not our business. The only thing we do is that we create value by first unbundling and then rebundling news articles. That's that's what we're in the business of. And then we're connecting readers to advertisers. So they also own, of course, the biggest advertising network. Now, pretty much until 2017, until it started to become really inescapable that Facebook was, to some extent, uh, uh, responsible for, for instance, the distribution of fake news, they were very hesitant about accepting that role. Even though more than 50% of Americans receive their news through newsfeed. So they are the biggest distributor of news in the United States and probably beyond, but they escape sectoral responsibility, which would force them to take on a duty of care, right? So that has been uh, a major uh, give and take in that sector. Now, who is responsible for a fair and democratic platform society, or particularly in the news area? And actually, how do we negotiate those public values? That has become a really important question. Now, here's a slide that most of you will probably have seen in their second year uh, political economic course in, at the university, but there's a very simple answer to that question, and that is we're basically all responsible for governing the digital, digital society because it's part of our society, the way we live. But Analytically, we have to divide that in uh, three different types of actors, my market, state, and civil society. Now, um, of course, you know, in uh, China, the state, state actors are mostly responsible for dealing with that system. And in the US system, of course, market 
actors dominate that system. But in Europe, which is squeezed in between, ideally, there's also an emphasis on how civil society actors and cooperate with state and um, uh, market actors to bring that to, into a balance. Very typical of Europe, the European Rhineland model of uh, political organization is, of course, that we uh, balance off the interests of the state and the market and civil society into what we call multi-stakeholder uh, organizations. Um, that is not unproblematic. For one thing, because in that digital system, the platform system that I just pointed out, the American system, civil society actors are systematically under re uh, represented. They're simply not there in the system, or they're very, very small. And they're particularly underrepresented in that trunk of the tree, where the intermediary platforms have a lot of power. And there's hardly any public space in that platform ecosystem where data flows, data are mostly proprietary. So let's go to that example of fake news and see how it works in that context. Who is responsible really for fake news and how can we solve therefore the problem of fake news? Now, this is a very complex problem because we're talking not simply about the single responsibility of one company for fake news. We could accuse Facebook of you know, organizing the fake news problem and just tell them they're in charge of that, but that wouldn't be fair because they're not the only uh, perpetrator of this uh, particular problem. So this kind of responsibility, we call it cooperative responsibility, it's basically the problem of many hands. In such a compl complex digital environment, who is really responsible for the distribution and also for uh, solving the problem of fake news? Now, of course, many of you would say, well, there's just one you know, particular actor in the uh, particular market actor that is responsible, and that's the troll factories, mostly in Russia or China or some in Europe. Um, they're businesses that basically create fake news, often either by a, because they have a commercial interest or a political interest, or most likely both. These kind of actors have always existed. It's nothing news, but the extent, the you know, the the, the enormous uh, uh, amount of fake news that they can produce now and be able to distribute, that is really unprecedented. And that is mostly because of the power of social media platforms who are in the business of distributing, not producing news, but distributing the news and bundling, uh, bundling that news with advertising. So these companies, you know, these fake news companies basically operate globally and they're thriving on the distribution mechanisms of social media, like virality, anonymity, recommendation en engines, et cetera, et cetera. Now we go back to Facebook. You know, we just saw in 2016, they were still uh, saying, well, we are not responsible for the distribution of fake news. But actually in 2017 and, you know, just last year, they came, they came to the conclusion that they are indeed, they need to acknowledge that they are part of the problem, at least that for the responsible for the distribution problem. And they started to pick up some responsibility for, uh, for this problem. But that actually wasn't until after advertisers and users and whistleblowers and uh, lawmakers, they pressured social media and particularly Facebook was really, really on the spot. Um, they really pressured them for doing something about fake news. Actually, in the end, b uh, Facebook really had to act because they had a very simple business argument. If they wouldn't filter out fake news from you know, the big data flows that they distribute, they, they risk that they're actually, you know, the, the channels that they are in charge of become so polluted, they can no longer uh, use that for proper business purposes. So from that point of view, they really had to clean up their act, basically. And they did that mostly using, you know, technical mechanisms by removing accounts. Over the past six months, I just looked this up, Facebook removed 3.4 billion fake accounts. They have, I think, 7 billion accounts. So they basically clean up more fake accounts than they have users, right? Uh, yeah, no, uh, this is per six months. So over a year, they have like twice as many fake accounts as they have uh, real accounts, which they call real. So this is a huge technological uh, challenge. 
Um, it's a constant battle with troll factories, which they're trying to uh, solve technologically, you know, by trying to remove them uh, constantly. But that's, of course, um, and that, of course, gets them into problems because many of those removed sites will be, f you know, not fake or people will argue they're legitimate. So over the past few weeks, maybe you have heard about that, they removed 210 Chinese news sites that misinformed ho the Hong Kong protesters. So this became a big, big issue where um, uh, Facebook was really in smack in the middle of um, uh, what is it? What does it mean to actually uh, remove those accounts? So it makes them responsible for part of that content, not just the distribution. Then, of course, came last year the Cambridge Analytica scandal, and Zucker Mark Zuckerberg was really forced to take on more responsibility, if only because he had to face senators both in uh, Washington and in Brussels who were demanding more regulation, and they were even threatening to break up the big tech companies, and that is a huge discussion right now, as you have probably noticed. Um, finally, in Brussels, I think the Washington, uh, uh, the Washington inter interrogation was really a big sort of flake uh, discussion between senators who were totally uninformed and Mark Zuckerberg, who had to explain the most basic uh, business model that, he is, uh, that Facebook is engaged in. But in Brussels, at least, he was faced, he was uh, confronted with his business model, which is, it, you know, it thrives on user engagement. So polarized hate speech and fake news and entertainment do much better than uh, so-called truthful um, content on social media. So they were bas basically interrogated about their uh, business model and how that promotes fake news and hate speech. Now, this discussion about whether Facebook is a media company or not is continuing until this very day. This was a couple of months ago. Anderson Cooper, Cooper on CNN interviewed Monica Brick Bickert, who is now in charge of uh, ethical issues at uh, Facebook. She's an executive. And she, uh, uh, Anderson Cooper asked this question, shouldn't you just get out of the news business? Which is an interesting question. And um, we'll probably discuss that later. But she answered, hey, we're not in the news business. We're in the social media business. And that is something different. But what does she mean by that? We're in the social media business. Now, over the past year, and this is very important, Facebook really took action and wanted to do something about fake news. They hired, for instance, 10,000 extra editors, which is, by the way, more than there are actual journalists in all the American newsrooms combined. So it's really something to have 10,000 editors add added to uh, the Facebook um, uh, conglomerate. Um, they were not simply doing that manually, of course, but they trained algorithms to do that. So in order for it to become a technological proce process, now, they did that mostly uh, through filter, teaching them filtering strategies. Some content is, f is flagged, of course, as harmful and is removed, but other fake videos are flagged as false and are just simply, you know, they put a break on distribution, but they're not removed. So that whole decision process is a matter of milliseconds where uh, people have to train algorithms to do that. The problem here, of course, and that's part of the dilemma, is what are the rules for moderation? Uh, Talton Gillespie has write, r written a wonderful book on that, but uh, the dilemma is really, if you're in the social media business, what does it mean to have those rules and to train algorithms to you know, filter out, uh, uh, to act as gatekeepers mostly? The problem is those rules we do not know. We cannot know because it's part of uh, Facebook's business secret. Okay, so that's for the market actors. What about state actors? Of course, in response, in response to the fake news problem, the European states took action, right? They were really fed up last year, and particularly Germany was very active in imposing uh, legal sanctions on online companies for distributing particularly hate speech, but also fake news. So now they should be removed within 24 hours after being posted. So what are the European states and more actual more states followed suit, you know, when Germany did that. But what is really uh, the problem here is the, the European states were basically saying you may not call yourself a news media company, you may not produce news, but you're still responsible for what you distribute. The dilemma is, uh, do you really want states to make platforms self-censor themselves in ways that do not provide transparent guidelines for 
people for us, for you and me, to know what happens within that platform. And that, of course, has not been regulated or not been regulated yet. So that's part of the dilemma. There are civil society actors who have been very, very active in filtering out uh, hate uh, uh, fake news particularly and who have taken actions. Um, Meden, for instance, is a consortium of designers and journalists. They're supported by Google, by the way, to develop tools for checking the news. Wiki Tribune was started last year by Jimmy Wales. It's a non-profit and it's also a Czech app. Uh, the German platform that I found was Correcti, Correctiv. Is that the right pronunciation? Are there people from Correctiv here, by the way? No, no. I had expected them to be here. But um, it's a non-profit. And, but actually last year they, began, they started to begin, work, uh, uh, began working with Facebook. And that, of course shows you the dilemma here, which is if you work with, as, as soon as you start to work with these companies or start to become part of that, um, uh, that ecosystem, can you still be independent? And does that really help th those public values to come out? Does it uh, make those rules more transparent? And then finally, um, citizens, of course, they have their own responsibility. You and I are users of these systems and we promote fake news simply by clicking. Now, the problem is, you know, algorithms often exploit human weaknesses. Like, it just as supermarkets put, you know, uh, they exploit people's craving for fat and salt and sugary things by putting it, you know, on eye at eye level. That's the way that these mechanisms work. So that's the thing that citizens are also consumers, and they heavily they heavily invest in sharing items online through social media, and they want to become you know, seeing they want to get that attention. So they're often trading privacy for convenience and for free attention, of course, for free information. So the problem here is, can you really make citizens responsible for fake news when you know that 60% of users in the US do not even recognize a sponsored story in their timeline, in their newsfeed? It's really, you know, that's how difficult it is to uh, to really decide what is fake news and what is not. Coming to a conclusion, I would like to draw attention to, you know, the uh, European landscape, and there are many European challenges ahead. Um, actually, I think Europe so far has been, has been you know, the, a beacon of how to implement public values in that space. But Europe's problem is, of course, that it doesn't have any influential um, plat platforms, particularly not those intermediary platforms. So what is, you know, what can Europe do to actually, you know, work on this problem when it doesn't have the, its own platforms? Well, for one thing, it has done some, a couple of, uh, you know, legal things. It has approached, is trying to approach that ecosystem as uh, sort of compartments of a legal challenge. For instance, the GDPR, which I think was pretty wonderful and very successful to some extent because it has been uh, copied by, uh, some American um, uh, tech companies. That was successful. We have been uh, given a couple of fines to Google, three so far, but that doesn't really make a dent in their uh, profitable business, of course. Um, I think one of the problems is that regulation currently is very compartmentalized. We have competition law, we have privacy law, we have tax law, we have you know, we have all these different compartments, but what is really needed is that we need to articulate a comprehensive strategy to counter these problems in an ecosystem that is not compartmentalized, where everything is vertic vertically uh, integrated. So even in terms of fake news, this is of course what the European uh, uh, Union could do. The European Commission issued a high level group that really advocate, advocates that multi-dimensional approach. And that report came out last year where states and companies and civil society organization were really challenged to work uh, to take on cooperative responsibility, as I call it. But it's a lot easier said than done. You know, there's very few public and civil society actors, as I just showed you, in that system. Um, there's an absence of uh, uh, integrated policy and well, very simply put, the tech, the tech company's business model is way too profitable. So, in terms of legislation, it will be very hard for Europe to take a stance. But in the meantime, I think there's 
some momentum in the United States where big tech is now taken on from both the left and the right and uh, being challenged in terms of its uh, uh, control of power. A second recommendation before uh, uh, I give the floor to you. I think Europe really needs to articulate a set of value-centric principles for market, state, and civilian actors. And EU uh, countries, I think there's really some momentum for this. For instance, here over the past few months, uh, um, uh, Twitter, for instance, finally took some, uh, Twitter and Facebook, by the way, they realized that public values are a lot more important, becoming more important. And earlier this year, Facebook, YouTube and Twitter were asked to sign a hate speech co uh, code, which I think was very important to align them in terms of how do we counter this problem. But the very least is that they realize they need to articulate those public values in order to you know, the, develop their uh, uh, business any further. And finally, this is my last point, I think really current regulation is not exactly well equipped to account for a platform society that is you know, so vertically integrated in terms of its platform power. We may have the right instruments, but we may lack the right approach. So for instance, concepts in our laws, in our legal system, the concepts of consumer welfare and markets may no longer apply to an ecosystem that is not just about markets, that it's about interdependent uh, platform markets, that is no longer just about consumers, but also involving citizens, in, uh, so which is a much broader term. So actually, this was just published two weeks ago, an article where we talk about what is needed to upgrade those terms. It's an internet policy review. It may be too legislative for you, but it's it's, you know, we try to work that out in terms of platform power. Now let's come back to the tree that I introduced earlier. Um, the real question was, is Facebook a media company or a news business? And this question has been going back and forth uh, between the US and Europe. And it's turned out to be very, very important for legislation and for regulation. The same happened to Uber, as you pro may remember, just three, four years ago in Spain. This was challenged in the Spanish court and it came all the way up to the European court that decided last year that Uber is a taxi company. It's not, it's calling itself a tech company, but it's no longer allowed to do that in Europe, which has major consequences for, uh, you know, legislation and regulation because it's now, uh, it has duty of care in a sector. It, it means something for taxes, for uh, uh, labor laws, et cetera, et cetera. So, Taking that to Facebook, is Facebook a social media company? And if so, what does that mean? There's currently no regulation for this. And this is actually what the whole question in the United States, where they're talking about breaking up tech companies um, and whether that will work or not. In the US uh, legislation, in the US law, there's uh, the fa tech companies are actually um, uh, falling under one section of the Communication Decency Act, which is section 230 for those of you who are interested and it says those um, uh, it, it actually provides immunity from liability for providers and users of an interactive computer service and this is where your definition of platforms comes in it has been very sort of nebulous for the past few years what a platform really is and this section 230 allowed all this room to tech companies to define for themselves what it is and what their uh, uh, what their liabilities are. So this is a sort of give and take and it's sort of a gray area in the law that we still need to fix. So we need to update the law, we need to make it more transparent and we need to have more precise regulation. In short, this is what, you know, if we've just looked at the problem, the, the, which is a wicked problem of fake news, but that shows you it's sort of representative or symbolic for the implications of the platformization of society. You can take that to any kind of problem and sort of, you know, see how profound the problems are. The ecosystems that I sketched have actually, you're shaping the very fabric of society, our norms and values, the democratic societies that we're currently engaged in and that, are, that have changed, you know, very profoundly because of these, the way that these platforms are organized. It, it seems far-fetched, but I think that once we look at the architecture of these systems, we see how that 
to some extent really you know collapses with or it's confronted by a democratic uh, democratically organized social system and those two do not yet match and we have to look for ways in which you know we can solve that problem so how is Europe going to translate those public values into rules and norms um, well the, the, the question you should actually turn around the question if they don't it will be done for them by tech companies and those you can count on that will not be the kind of uh, democratic uh, civil society kind of public values that you would like to implement see implemented in Europe so I think we really need to go back to the architectural design of how this system works and we need to ask ourselves what is it that we want from a platform society what kind of public values uh, do we need to redesign if not you know from scratch so that may be uh, too abstract of a note to you know to uh, to finish on but i hope we can have some you know question and answer so we can well hopefully solve this problem over the next 15 minutes <laughs> thank you thank you very much Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting talk, for this giving us the framework we are working within. And, and uh, wir können, glaube ich, Fragen auf Deutsch stellen, ja, wenn Sie möchten. Ja. Langsam Ach, sprechen. Ja. Äh, wenn wir das Problem in 15 Minuten lösen wollen, schaffen wir das nicht alleine. Dann sind wir jetzt auf Fragen oder Lösungsvorschläge angewiesen. Bitte schön. Ja, Volker, vielleicht für die ähm, Übersetzer. Ja, Volker Scholz, wenn es stimmt, dass diese Baumstruktur, die Sie dargestellt haben, im Prinzip in Europa so gar nicht existiert, dann ist ja schon eine sehr wichtige Frage, unabhängig davon, wie wir diese äh, Plattform regulieren äh, werden oder haben wir eigentlich eine in Europa oder können wir eine entwickeln und wenn ja, wie müsste die aussehen und welche äh, Teile müsste sie umfassen? Also können Sie dazu noch was sagen? Ich meine, ja. sonst ist ja klar, dass man zerrieben wird zwischen zwei verschiedenen Ansätzen. Findet Europa sozusagen den dritten Weg oder haben Sie Ideen, ja. wie Europa diesen Weg finden könnte? <lacht> Weil ja dieser ganze Baum eigentlich, wenn ich das richtig verstehe, ja. so bei uns jedenfalls in Systemen distribuiert ist, die bisher nicht plattformfähig sind. Ja, that's a very good question. Can we actually change that system? Um, yes and no. We can try. <lacht> yeah. um, first, we're all of the platforms, of course, fall under US jurisdiction, so you can't really force them to change anything in its architecture or in a, you know the business model um, on the other hand Europe could do a couple of more things I didn't have I had in my original slide I had two more recommendations and one of them is to start and support more public platforms Europe has always tried for instance about 10 or 12 years ago what Europe has tried is to start European Google uh, it was it continued for a few years and then it was butchered it suddenly stopped and they no longer wanted to pour public money into uh, uh, this this platform that happened to a couple of others uh, basically skype was started as a european platform then it was sold to microsoft and i can mention like 10 or so examples where europe started with its own public on pub, um, public values uh, uh, based system of of platforms and it never worked now you can ask why doesn't that work um, that I think will not get us anywhere because you know it's simply something that you know happened and now actually we're now at a point where it's very very difficult to invest in another totally different system what we can do though is um, and that I think the GDPR is an, an interesting example in that respect um, we can articulate certain values this was just privacy and secure you know there's some uh, part of that is security but you can at least articulate public values that force these platforms to accommodate to f you know f uh, uh, to change the platforms to accommodate european users in that respect the gdpr has been tremendously influential because it has forced even you know american platforms to take that more or less as the standard for uh, world action on privacy you know their global uh, systems are now accommodating towards the GDPR. So they're moving towards that European standard. Um, in the meantime, I think it's very important that we look at our public sectors. I mentioned uh, education and also health, which I think are tremendously important sectors. In education, uh, Germany, like Holland, I think, is still uh, thriving on public systems, but 
as we speak, I'm now doing some research into primary schools in Holland. And what we're seeing there, and this happened a long time ago in the United States, or I mean years ago, long time is four years, and continuing until this very day, you see the platformization of public education. And that means that uh, uh, Google Apps for Education, for instance, is now sort of given away in Chrome laptops and they're en uh, penetrating schools. And that is, of course, an area where Europe really needs to look into because that is public money, it's a public sector, and there should be different rules for public sectors than for private sectors. But that, those are areas where I think Europe can still play an in incredible important role in terms of legislation and regulation. Is that some sort of a beginning of your answer? I could talk about just this question for about an hour, but I won't. Sure, there's another question. Wenn Sie ganz kurz Ihren Namen gegen Hintergrund yeah, sagen. Uh, I'm, I'm Andreas von Bubnov. Um, um, I was just wondering, you mentioned education. Um, it's kind of ironic that I actually thought education, uh, as long as it remains to the states, um, might be able to help by educating people, um, maybe putting something in the high school curricula to, to teach people, everyone at a young age, you know, this is the difference between uh, sponsored articles yeah. and, you know, so, so, they, so they finally, they, they know, apparently a lot of people don't know it. What's the role of education there, you think? Well, um, I would have another slide, but I think media literacy educa education is another remedy to this problem. Uh, I didn't finish my slides on what are remedies uh, towards, you know, fake news as a, uh, as a problem, but media education obviously is, you know, a very, very important remedy. Um, I think the one of the problems that uh, confronts children these days is um, that they have never learned to look at news in the context of news as an institution. They no longer read newspapers, at least I don't know how it is here, but my students you know, hardly any of them read a newspaper as a curriculum. Uh, some of them go to the immediately to the news side of the big newspapers. Most of them get their news through, through f Facebook. And so there's certainly coming up a generation right now that has lost the context of news as an institution. That's what we call context collapse. I wonder, and I can't tell, I can't predict what's going to happen to that, that generation who is basically unconscious of the, the, the institutional context of news. I'm pretty sure they will learn, they will be taught a different way of uh, understanding what is news and what is not. But currently in this news landscape where there's still no rules for what is fake news and what is not, for filtering out you know, what, is, uh, what is good news and bad news more or less, it will be very, very hard to, and very, it will, I think it will, require a lot of not just attention, but also um, goodwill from the tech companies to sort that out and to make those rules transparent. Without transparency, for me, it's hardly possible to teach media education because if I don't know the rules that Facebook imposes on its system, how can we learn children to recognize, you know, what is news and what is uh, special interest or what is uh, political propaganda? That, you know, if those rules are hidden behind algorithms and those algorithmic black boxes uh, do not allow us to peer into them and explain to our students what it does to news, then it will become very difficult. But I do believe in media education as an educator. Thank you for the talk. It's very interesting and it's also very depressing, actually, <laughs> because... I'm um, sorry to depress you on this no, Monday morning. <laughs> I was trying to be more optimistic. Well, it uh, it does seem globally, hearing it summed up like this, like we're like globally sliding backwards and towards platformization and monopolies of these platforms. So my question is, do you stay hopeful? And if so, what kind of developments give you hope? How do you stay hopeful? <laughs> well, that's... Um, yeah, I do stay hopeful. I usually end my, s end my talks on a very positive note. And why do I stay hopeful? Because I think that eventually we will be working, co I believe in collaborative uh, responsibility, cooperative responsibility. And I think that's eventually how we will sort this out. Will it take you know, a long time? Yes, it will, because, and particularly because these systems, they evolve 
as we speak, and it's very hard to interfere with these systems. E each time we think, oh, now we have understood the rules, you know, it's changed again. Now through AI and facial recognitions, they're, they're total game changers where if they are built into those big ecosystems, you know, it's really changing the, the, the face of that game again, again. And this happens constantly. So what we need to do is to constantly work on all these fronts and all these ends, economically, politically, but also scientifically and you know, technologically. I think we need a lot of engineers that are being taught public values in their careers and during their education to understand what um, al uh, algorithmic power is and what it does to users in general. And that's, I always remain hopeful and I always stay very positive because I see good examples. And I see that, well, let's, let me give you one example. I just talked about Google and how it was working on Project Dragonfly. Over the past, just over the past year, Google employees have become a real force in forcing Google more or less to comply with certain public values. You know, they acted very responsively towards facial recognition. It was actually San Francisco who is now barring facial recognition from entering the city. But it was Google employees who walked out on issues like uh, equal, uh, equal rights on uh, tax evasion. They uh, were very, very critical of dragonflies. So they really make political demands. And I think it's that sort of um, organization between employees that may sort of promote or, or support people in standing up for public values. It doesn't just have to be the public sector who can do that. It can be, you know, employees of tech platforms themselves who can actually implement those values in their company. Mit Blick auf die Zeit, ich würde das gerne noch aufgreifen. Jetzt haben wir hier vorwiegend Journalisten und Wissenschaftler. Was würden Sie denen raten? Weil zum Teil sieht man da auch so eine Resignation. Man kann das ja sowieso nicht umgehen. Ja, man wir haben äh, durchaus Streit in Medienunternehmen, ja. ob man sozusagen die Großen, die sie genannt haben, noch weiter befördern soll. Zum Teil muss man es, da gibt es auch unterschiedliche Wege. In der Wissenschaft genauso, springt man jetzt auf die drauf? Oder ja, würden Sie diese Allianz aus Wissenschaftlern und Journalisten, die hier zusammenkommt, wenn Sie für die einen Rat, wie Sie vielleicht ja. jenseits der ja. Systeme noch einen weiteren Big Player aufbauen können? Ja, um I think for, uh, especially for engineers who've been working in this area for da and for data journalists, they have been cooperating for the past few years and I think that's very much a good thing. I think they need to do that more. They also need to stay independent and that may be harder. I was talking about Correctif here, but also I know the example in the Netherlands where at Leiden University, there was a um, university cooperative that started as a nonprofit, started to work with Facebook and with YouTube in terms of you know, uh, uh, fake news um, uh, detection. Um, it lasted for six months and then they got into this fight about uh, independency, basically. Are they, were they doing this work for Facebook or were they doing it for the university? Was it independent um, academic research? And that of course is a dilemma that we're constantly facing. That's what, uh, wha what I was trying to uh, uh, put out in my talk. Um, independence and um, a sort of reflection on why it is that you're doing this, for whom, in whose interest. That should be, you know, from the very beginning, if you start collaborating with market, state and civil society actors, you need to make that clear. And you need to uh, sort of work on each other's expectations to make clear what independence means. As an academy president, I've seen this over and over again. It always, you know, we were talking about this before the talk. Um, those different special interest groups continue to collide and that's a good thing. That's how negotiation of values works. We need to collide, but we also need to come to a certain understanding that that balance between state markets and civil society is actually crucial to balancing off this you know, uh, big power play. And that is why it's so important to really know what each other of each other's expectations. What is it that you're in for? What is it that you expect to come out of this? And if you don't do that, if you don't articulate it very explicitly, you have a very big chance of running into each other halfway down the project and it will fall apart. Is that a piece of advice that I <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Ganz herzlichen Dank, Frau van Dijk, für den Vortrag. Jetzt haben wir das nicht in 15 Minuten gelöst, das Problem, aber wir haben jetzt ja noch zweieinhalb Tage Zeit. 
daran ja. zu arbeiten, neben den anderen spannenden Dingen, über die wir reden werden. Ihnen herzlichen Dank fürs Kommen. Sie sind heute noch da, also wer gleich noch mit Ihnen sprechen will. Volker Stollotz wird jetzt noch ein paar organisatorische Dinge sagen, damit wir durch okay. die zweieinhalb Tage auch gut kommen. Well, thank you very much for coming Danke and I really appreciate your attention. Äh, nur kurz noch ein paar Anmeldungen, äh, Anmerkungen zur Struktur des Programms. Also äh, es gibt erstmal im Internet natürlich saika.de, könnt das gesamte Programm, auch alle Speaker, alle Descriptions der Sessions anschauen. Es gibt auch noch diesen kleinen Flyer, den man sich dort am Desk äh, abholen kann, in dem sozusagen zumindest nochmal die Titel, der Ort und die Zeit der unterschiedlichen Sessions äh, angegeben wird. Wir haben die sozusagen kategorisiert in äh, vier verschiedene Typen. Die sieht man auch an den Farben. Also äh, Best Practice, Kooperationsprojekte, Wissenschaft und Datenjournalismus. Das zweite ist Datenschatz versus Datenschutz. Äh, der dritte Bereich sind Sessions zur Desinformation. Und dann gibt es noch spezifische Sessions zu Methoden und Tools äh, in Wissenschaft und Datenjournalismus. Und nicht zuletzt äh, die sonstigen Veranstaltungen. Darauf möchte ich Sie heute sch schon mal hinweisen. Wir werden ja heute Abend im Dortmunder U äh, ein Get-Together zusammen haben können. Und da möchte ich Sie bitten, dass Sie dann nach der Ende der letzten Sessions um 18.30 Uhr sich möglichst direkt hier vor dem ähm, erich Broßhaus versammeln, damit wir dann zusammen praktisch, weil wir müssen mal einmal kurz mit der S-Bahn fahren, es wäre gut, wenn möglichst viele Leute dann sozusagen direkt mit ins Dortmunder U kommen könnten. Dort ist dann ab 19 Uhr sozusagen Saika Get-Together with a View über Dortmund. Das wollte ich noch gesagt haben, eventuelle Programmänderungen, die sich in letzter Minute ergeben, die werden Sie draußen, ist ja nochmal ein großer Plan auch von äh, dem Programm, in dem Tagesprogramm. Und da können Sie auch nochmal schauen, wenn sich irgendwelche Sessions leicht verändert haben sollten, dann werden wir Sie darüber natürlich informieren. Genau, ansonsten würde ich sagen, entsprechend auch dem Motto, Kooperation, da geht mehr, würde ich sagen. Also let's talk together und die Mittagspause ist jetzt die gute Gelegenheit, damit gleich zu beginnen. Wir werden dann weitermachen um ähm, 13.30 Uhr mit einer zweiten Tradition, die wir bei der Saika haben. Wir hatten ja Herrn Thiel vom Statistischen Bundesamt im letzten Jahr hier und daraus hat sich auch ein fruchtbarer Dialog äh, entfaltet zwischen einer staatlichen Behörde und der datenjournalistischen Community. Und wir werden diesmal... Ähm, Paul Becker vom Bundesamt für Kartografie und Geodäsie äh, sozusagen hier haben mit einem Impuls zum Thema räumliche Analysen in Wissenschaft und Öffentlichkeit, Grundlagen und Potenziale. Darauf freue ich mich auch persönlich sehr und werden das dann auch noch in einer Diskussion vertiefen. Ähm, danach werden sozusagen Parallelsessions in drei verschiedenen Räumen angeboten. Wir haben einmal den großen Saal und in dem großen Saal werden alle Präsentationen, die hier auf Deutsch sind, für die ausländischen Gäste ins Englische übersetzt. Dann haben wir noch zwei Räume, einer ist hier unten, das ist B15 und einer ist oben, das ist C55 und äh, den finden Sie aber auch sozusagen ausgeschrieben. Ja, und ansonsten wünsche ich jetzt ein schönes erstes Zusammentreffen bei einem kleinen Lunch da draußen und viel Spaß bei der Saika.